Well, eight black rhinos have died in one day. Not through poaching, no, no, no. In fact, the rhinos were the most guarded animals in Savo East National Park at the time of their death. The rhinos had just been translocated to Savo from Nakuru and Nairobi National Parks, where Kenya Wildlife Service says the numbers were too many. The death of the rhinos is a big loss to conservation efforts of the black rhino that remains a critically endangered animal. Before the tragic translocation, Kenya had 750 black rhinos. The deaths also remain a big mystery, with preliminary investigations showing they died after drinking salty water. But why only eight out of the 11 that had been moved there? While briefing the media today on the rhino death, a Tourism and Wildlife Cabinet Secretary Najib Balala said the animals could have died due to a heat wave. Yes, you heard me right. Again, we ask, a heat wave in this month, July? Conservationists are demanding for answers and so are many other wildlife lovers. The translocation was a delicate and highly risk exercise and even the tourism CS acknowledged it on the day when the translocation was launched in June this year. Let's listen into what he had to say then. Uh, there is a lot of uh, work required in preparation as well as on uh, the candidate when uh, that thing has taken place. It's very traumatizing for us because anything can go wrong. Uh, within 20 minutes you need to make sure that you have darted the animal as well as revived it and, and put it on the truck uh, again revived uh, because anything can go wrong and uh, we can lose the animal. Well, that is Tourism CS, Cabinet Secretary, of course, Najib Balala. We're going to play some of the sound bites from his press briefing today. Of course, the numbers were seven of the rhinos which died. It later increased to eight. And now, latest report indicate that the rhinos that died actually were nine. And the CS said that 18 horns were tracked to Voy. Up until now, we don't know whose custody uh, that uh, horns are under up until this moment. And tonight on the show, I shall be speaking to two wildlife crusaders. That is Reynard Bonke, the program's officer with Friends of Nairobi National Park, as well as Chris Diaz, a director at Wildlife Direct. But before that, our lead reporter, Sophia Nuna, is on standby with more insights on this deadly rhino translocation. Sophia, good evening. I understand you're with an expert there on this matter. This is something that has shocked so many, not just in Kenya, but across the world, right? Correct, Yusuf. This is a story that has uh, dominated even international headlines unprecedented. How does this happen in this day and age? This translocation is an exercise that, as you heard earlier from the CS, in terms of the danger in the exercise, it's one that's known. And so uh, measures being put in place in as far as uh, conditions being looked into where the animals are going to, how this exercise has been taken. Because they're put uh, to sleep, if you like, for this transportation or journey or translocation, as it's referred to, then revived on arrival. How was it then we're hearing at first it was reports around salty water, highly uh, salty water. Now we're hearing about a heat wave, and you correctly uh, put that question out. It's a month that most Kenyans are talking, talking about cold and the Kenyan winter version. So there's still quite a number of lingering questions, and this being something that stands out, the black rhino endangered. Uh, according to some of the statistics we're seeing right now, as it stands, less than 5,000 around the world, all of them in Africa, and as far as those that are remaining, uh, and as far as what we can tell, even their children and children's children to be able to see. So it's quite unfortunate that, that this happened, and in applicable at this point, at least what we've heard so far. Most people are still saying it doesn't quite make sense. But let me speak to a man who, in as far as conservation efforts in the country, has been involved. Remember, poaching is one of the biggest concerns around that. And Benson Ocheng is an environmental lawyer. But before we get to this, Rhinos, uh, give us just a little bit of background of your involvement in as far as securing these treasures in our country are concerned. Uh, thank you. Um... I'm an environmental lawyer, mm -hmm. to describe myself briefly uh, as a professional. I've been involved in a lot of uh, policy development and legislative reforms in the wildlife sector in this country. I recently served as the Joint Secretary of the Task Force on Wildlife Security, uh, linked to the current or present agenda that uh, we are talking about. It's all about the future of wildlife in this country. 
And uh, in the course of developing the report, we found a number of challenges uh, that is facing our wildlife, ranging from poaching to wildlife habitat destruction, and basically poor policy planning and implementation in the right. country. Right. right. So on this particular story, it is one that has captured international attention. You go online, there are headlines across the board on this, the magnitude, the number of rhinos we are losing at one instant. In, in a scenario that usually poaching, many would say, okay, they managed to get away with it. But it's uh, until now we're hearing the CS talking about a, hate, a heat we, uh, wave, I beg your pardon, that caused this. What do you make of this? Well, it's really difficult to fault the CS this early in time because for certain, the uh, different versions of the problem that we are hearing is well a case of not being able to determine that quickly what exactly could have happened. Mm -hmm. So I think basically is a symptom that we are groping the duck and still can't lay our hands on what really happened. But it also speaks to some of the main challenges that we are facing. Uh, in terms of policy planning, one usually must ask oneself how it turned out that uh, wildlife all of a sudden became a tourism issue. It basically demonstrates uh, uh, that we may not have had our priorities right in terms of aligning the conservation function with the economic needs of, of this country in terms of what wildlife can fetch. And for me, that is probably a starting point. As far as we know, the CS mm -hmm. is not a conservation expert. For all his knowledge in tourism, this is not a matter that falls squarely in the docket of tourism. So one can start raising questions there. But then the more important questions that then arise is, what exactly happened? What was the process that was followed in translocation? This is not the first time that Kenya is doing this, and we understand it could have been done for good reasons. One just hopes that it wasn't simply to short circuit the system so that we could easily uh, exit out some economic gains from it through tourism without having strong understanding and research uh, that could inform the need for that translocation. Mm -hmm. We understand that it was done uh, basically because the uh, Nairobi National Park and Nakuru National Parks uh, have exceeded their capacity to accommodate the rhinos that we have there. But the more important thing should have been uh, proper planning, a good understanding of what it meant to translocate these animals to their new environments, of course, in conservation circles, we understand it is most important to have animals raised and bred in their natural habitat. Mm. Translocation basically takes them to a new environment. And unless you undertake serious studies and ensure that they are not going to be unduly interfered with in terms of their needs, then you are likely to see the kind of thing that we have seen. Yeah. Right. So what would you say as far as who dropped the ball here? Because on one hand, when they were being translocated, it was a media event. We covered it live. And at the time, the CS considered it's a delicate process. And across the board, they say it's one that is delicate. A lot of care and caution must be taken. And research, you'd imagine, would take place from where they're you know, the environment they're coming from to where they're going. So this is a serious case of one dropping the ball, an organization, a person, institution. Well, exactly that is what we need to do uh, moving forward. Of course, it's so easy to point fingers, but it's also not important at this time, really, to point fingers in any particular direction. We need to investigate to find out what really happened. Mm -hmm. Definitely, there is an underlying problem. And the underlying problem revolves around the decision that was made and how it was made to translocate these animals. Because the fact they didn't survive simply means that there is a, a, a serious problem with the decision that was made and how it was made and executed in the first so place. So fingers should be pointed, as, isn't as, it, to hold to account? Well, in a sense, we hold the people responsible for the docket of wildlife conservation responsible. And we also have to note that uh, the way we have designed uh, that particular docket doesn't necessarily align with the need for conservation. We have put wildlife conservation under tourism, mm. which means that the dominant approach then would be to look at wildlife as an economic, wildlife management as an economic activity. Mm. It is a sustainability activity. It is about conservation as opposed to, uh, to just tourism and uh, earning foreign exchange. And I think 
Uh, when all is said and done, we might well make the link between that decision, the way we align our conservation objective with that particular choice to have wildlife in that docket. Mm. The second thing then is to say, okay, how much input did we give or preparation did we have for this process? The fact these animals died definitely is a pointer to a big underlying problem. And uh, if, if we followed the protocols required and I took serious studies in the first place, made the necessary preparations to ensure that the animals, even if they were going to um, undergo some stress in terms of change in the environment and of course uh, issues of food shortages and water shortages that align uh, or come into play, then we would have just to ensure, or we would have needed to ensure that there was very limited uh, interference in yeah. the way these animals are uh, leave mm. and uh, and basically I think that is where the challenge is yeah uh, somebody didn't do a good job the institution responsible is squarely Kenya Wildlife Service of course with partners and one must point out that these partners may be doing a good job but sometimes there is a lot of haste to get it done mm -hmm. and tick the boxes okay. where we don't have enough patience to do what is required. And I think that is something that we need to review and uh, not do similar mistakes in the future. In the future, indeed. Yeah. Benson Ocheng, environmental lawyer, thank you. So much for making time for us here on the big uh, story. Yusuf, the world continues to reel Kenyans, especially around the deaths of these black rhinos. And we hope mm -hmm. at the end of the day, uh, those responsible will be held to account, not just uh, hearing that this and the other happen, because it's not the first time we've seen translocation, even in terms of elephants and some of those uh, rallying around those calls will tell you in one time we are able to translocate a hundred elephants with no incident. So mm -hmm. this stands out, this is peculiar, this is questionable and surely uh, Kenyans and the world demanding answers for how could this have happened, Yusuf? Of course, so many questions have been answered. Kenyans are demanding, you know, uh, answers for those uh, questions. Many thanks, Sophia, for that. Here now is the Tourism and Wildlife Cabinet Secretary Najib Balala confirming that only two rhinos out of the 11 that had been moved to the Savo East Sanctuary from Nairobi and Nakuru National Parks are alive. Let's listen into what he had to say. Uh, the ones have survived so far are two. And uh, we have confirmed this morning with the park management that they're in good health. They were seen yesterday, one in Maungu and one around the, the sanctuary this morning, early morning. Uh, unfortunately, nine of them uh, died due to reasons that we are still investigating. The preliminary report that we got from the experts from KWS was saying is the saline water that was in one of the boreholes that high level, had, had, had high level of uh, saline. Uh, unfortunately, that has happened. Uh, we have uh, called upon Professor Gathumi from Nairobi University. He was there on Thursday and Friday. He's taken all the samples. He promised us by the 23rd of this month, he will give us a comprehensive post-mortem report. Uh, we have also sent a team to take samples of the feed, which is the Luzan and the sugar cane that was provided to the animals uh, to see if there's any problem with the feed. That is Tourism and Wildlife Cabinet Secretary Najib Balala there speaking. Remember, we have experts who are going to join us by way of phone shortly, and we have some of them in studio, and they're going to tell us what ought to have been done to avoid this kind of, you know, a disaster, for lack of a better word. For now, let me remind you about the details of the big story tonight by taking you through a quick look at some infographics on our Super Bowl. There you go. The rhinos killed are eight, but we're getting letters to report that they are actually nine. And the rhinos translocated were 11, and the translocation targeted a total of 14 uh, rhinos, an exercise that has now been suspended until further notice. And the rhinos were being moved from Nairobi National Park and Nakuru National Parks to Savo East uh, National Park, where they 
Tourism and Wildlife Ministry says that Tsavo is expected to be more conducive for breeding. Of course, one of the reasons they're saying they've translocated uh, those animals are there. And then the translocation uh, process itself cost 100 million Kenyan shillings and was partly funded by the World Wide Fund. And of course, the reasons, uh, the pre preliminary findings for the reasons of the death of uh, the nine rhinos are said to be salt poisoning through water. And let's take a look at the numbers. We have a total of 745 black rhinos in Kenya, a total of 1,258, and then 149 rhinos have been translocated in 13 years in Kenya. And now, in studio, once again, I have Reynard Bonke from the Friends of Nairobi Nationals Park, and then I have Chris Diaz, who's the director of Wildlife Direct. On phone, I'm going to speak shortly to Dr. Modokai Ogada, who is a carnivore ecologist, as well as Jim Nyamu, who is a conservationist and an elephant activist. Good evening, gentlemen, and welcome to the program. Renard, let me begin with you. We've had that explanation from the preliminary investigation uh, by the Wildlife Ministry. And of course, we've had that briefing from the CS himself, Najib Balala. Are you satisfied from those explanations that these rhinos were killed by saline water and by extension heat waves in this month? Of course, these are cold season in Kenya. Uh, well, <clears throat> for, uh, for a start, I believe the uh, translocation exercise uh, was, done for, uh, was done for a good reason. Uh, because, you know, like uh, the lawyer said before, the, uh, the carrying capacity of the two national parks, you know, have been exceeded by the black rhinos. So I believe the translocation has always been done and they've always been successful in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, but now what has happened to me is a conservation national disaster because uh, uh, translocation exercise uh, for the black rhinos began in the year 2005. And between the year 2005 and uh, 2017, about 149 uh, black rhinos have been tra uh, translocated. And in that period of, t uh, of time, uh, for one reason or the other, we've only you know, lost about eight black rhinos. But now mm -hmm. this one, in one single exercise, uh, it started as, uh, you know, um, it was seven, and then moved to eight. And today at the press conference, I was there. Mm -hmm. The cabinet secretary said that uh, nine uh, rhinos uh, have died, and he confirmed that. So mm -hmm. I, I really cannot tell. Uh, the first, you know, when we started hearing stories, it did not come from the Kenya Wildlife Service uh, themselves. The, uh, the, the issue was a bit kept, you know, uh, kind of secret, mm -hmm. and uh, it only came out when the public pressure was piling up. Mm -hmm. So that alone was a gap and, uh, you know, raised questions of whether there was really something sinister, uh, you know, with uh, this translocation exercise that we, we, the public is not aware of. Mm -hmm. So let me, let, me, let me bring Chris into this conversation. Now, Chris, you've heard what the CS has mentioned there. Of course, he's saying that with regards to the preliminary investigation, is if he believes uh, that the death of these rhinos were caused by saline water. I'm going to speak to some uh, experts shortly. But from your own, uh, you know, experience, understand that you have a lot of experience when it comes to matters of wildlife in this country. Are you satisfied with those explanations so far? Well, I think it's, uh, to be fair, with, uh, we're very upset, uh, uh, conservationists and uh, international uh, partners and uh, international fund, uh, funding organizations and sponsors give a lot of funds, as you know, over 100 uh, million shillings was mm -hmm. invested into this translocation. I would not want to draw any conclusion because it would be fair for us to also understand exactly what went wrong and the investigations are ongoing. Mm -hmm. But for sure, uh, we have had very good experience in doing translocations. It's a thin and fine balance be between the economic value for tourism that the, the rhino, the black rhino, which is an endangered species uh, in Africa and particularly in Kenya, we have millions of tourists coming to see such a beautiful animal. Mm -hmm. so, so I think in my view is uh, things were not very well planned things went wrong and uh, we must handle this very well because the international community community wants answers, uh, the Kenyans want answers and we, we, we expect the CS to be shortly giving us the exact scientific explanation what exactly went wrong that yes. we lost this. this yes, rhinos. Chris, even, even as we await for that explanation uh, from the wildlife and the tourism cabinet sector of extension, of course, as ministry, uh, Chris, here we're talking about rhinos. These are endangered animals and losing nine of them at a go. I mean, how of a blow is this to the conservation effort in this country? 
Well, it's, 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 it's really a serious disaster we are devastated because the, the black rhinos uh, in their breeding program, they can take between two and a half years to five years and they give single calf, that means to, to just one single rhino by birth. Mm -hmm. And this has taken a lot of years of building up to these nine, nine rhinos. So, so to catch up now, and uh, we, we really need to, to build up our rhino population in Kenya and Africa. So mm -hmm. it's a big blow for us, uh, for conservation, uh, people and for the people of Kenya. We're going to talk shortly about what ought to have been done to avoid this you know, uh, disaster that has happened in Kenya. Now, uh, Reynard, before we take a break, perhaps can you tell us uh, this? Of course, this is a process that you know, uh, cost both the ministry and the world, world, WWF about, about 100 million Kenyan shillings. Do you think this exercise, the whole of it was pointless you know, from your experience with regards to Nairobi National Park? Do you think it was really necessary to move these animals from Nairobi National Park to Sava? Well, based on the reasons uh, that have been given by the Kenya Wildlife Service, uh, it was necessary to be done mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the park had exited, exited its uh, you know, current capacity. But again, uh, this again boils down to, 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 to what the public should know because uh, uh, the CS uh, told us today at the press conference that uh, uh, an environmental and ecological assessment was conducted. Uh, it's, it's, we, are, we are just knowing this right now, so we don't know who was involved and how they were involved. So. If we could, you know, get this report and, 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 and that's when you can, you know, form a basis of our investigations mm -hmm. and that's when you can really tell actually what happened. So it boils down to really uh, information to the public and again, uh, type of stakeholders that were involved in uh, this, you know, assessment was being done. So was it a copy paste type of uh, assessment as has been the norm in the environmental sector or, uh, or was it actually done and everything, uh, you know, uh, to prove that this was the right timing and mm -hmm. it was really necessary again a resource that he has given about the heat waves and the salinity was a uh, was a test conducted before you know moving the rhinos to to that particular area like uh, the salinity level whether they were they could really you know uh, perform or, or or adjust to that environment so this information that had are not out there in public and the question uh, it, uh, you know the question remains that where can we get this report and how was everything done in the first place? Well said, Renard. Of course, we're going to probe this matter even further. I'm going to speak to both Dr. Bodekai Ogado, who is a carnivore ecologist, as well as Jim Nyamu shortly. But before that, we're going to take a very short break. But when we return, we'll still have a lot more to tell you. Of course, you're watching The Big Story right on KTN News. Stay with us. We'll be right back.